seu de la Academia Europea en el Mediterráneo, que es la profesora Genoveva Martí, Mau Nostrana, creo que es la presidenta, en su explicará, y por eso creo que eh, utilizaremos la lengua inglesa, aparte que la conferencia antes, lógicamente, hablará en inglés, yo si podría hablar en árabe, pero sería más complicado para nosotros. Eh, bé, yo solamente no he de decir nada, porque estoy aquí como invitado al SOMA, así que no, no fent re. Pero solamente la idea que fa el año 2006, cuando va a comenzar el equipo anterior, el presidente eh, Salvador Giné y ahora también el nuestro presidente actual, que es el profesor eh, Joan Domènez Ross, se excusa porque tiene una cosa y está sustituido por el vicepresidente. Eh, Don ya ama al Salvador Giné, es un famoso sociólogo. Uh, yo le voy a proponer la idea de hacer la, com era, el Día Internacional de las Dones. Eh, sabeu, doncs, és, és una prova de que encara es necesita fe, porque si no, no, no se celebra el, el Día Internacional de los Homes, pero es así, se celebra en todo el mundo y desde el llavors se han hecho el defet, el eh, Instituto, entre otras muchas publicaciones, publica una revista en inglés que es diu Contribution to Science y en guany doncs, farem un recull de las muchas conferencias de, de, de diferentes tipos que se han hecho. Y Anguany es un día especial, es un año especial, porque tienen dos conmemoraciones. Para la coincidencia de datos, don Sabuí hablará Nadia, que ya la presentará eh, José Piqueras, que es la presidenta de la Sociedad Catalana de Comunicación Científica, y Dama haré un acta de récord de una microbióloga, bióloga norteamericana, que es de ella, Lynn Marbles que va, va morir fa dos años, el 22 de novembre del 2011, y que tenía muchas relaciones con Cataluña y con esta casa. Bé, de dit això, uh, let's uh, talk in English. We are very honored to, to be, to have in the Institute for Catalan Studies, uh, which represents uh, many, many things. Not only Catalonia, as you know, uh, Valencia, and also Balearic Islands, in uh, Andorra, in the south of France, uh, Roussillon, uh, Roussillon, and also in a tiny, small city in the Sardinian coast in Italy, which is uh, Alguero. So it's, it's a community, it's not, uh, it's not frontiers, political frontiers, and uh, it's a, a community of about 10 million people, and we are the academy of all this. And uh, perhaps it would be necessary to, for all of you, the, you speak uh, Catalan, that to remember uh, one thing that happened with Pete Seeger, that recently uh, died, I suppose, uh, that uh, when Pete Seeger introduced a friend of him, uh, Raymond Peleguero, introducing him for a concert in some place in the United States, uh, he, Pete Seeger, apologized for introducing a singer that was speaking a dialect. And because Raymond was speaking a dialect, Catalan. And uh, Pete Seeger asked the audience, the floor, which was the difference between a dialect and a language. It's a language is a dialect with an army. We don't have army, so we speak dialect. So the culture is not, the importance of a culture is not measured in the uh, the millions of kilometers, the millions of inhabitants, but the strength of the culture, of the, of the produce of this. And there are no doubt that since the Middle Ages, Catalan culture is, has extended in the world. It's very important. We are now working with one of the most important philosophers, and be, uh, better known in the United States, for instance, which is Raimundo Lulius, Ramon Llull. So this is one of these and many others recently we had several, so this is the importance of the Catalan culture. Uh, with this, I will uh, pass the, the word to the uh, director of the Academia Europea. Thanks, Ricard. Um, my name is Genoveva Marti, and I'm the academic director of the Barcelona Knowledge Hub of the Academia Europea. Mm -hmm. And we are co-organizing the celebration of International Women's Day with the Institut d'Estudis Catalans, which is one of the sponsors of the Barcelona Knowledge Hub, and also our host, because our offices are located in this beautiful building. Uh, the Academia Europea is the Academy of Sciences and Humanities of Europe. 
It has about 3,000 members, and among them it counts with several, quite a number of Nobel Prizes, field medal winners, and other prestigious awards. Uh, its members are prestigious scientists. About two years ago, the Academia Europea decided to open a hub, an office, that would take care of its activities in, in southern Europe and in the Mediterranean, and Barcelona was the city chosen. We started operating in January 2013, so we have been operating for just over a year. And our mission, the mission of the Barcelona Knowledge Hub, is to promote scientific activities that are multidisciplinary activities, especially in which the input of the humanities and the social sciences is important, precisely because we think that the problems that we face are multifaceted and they have to be solved and they have to be faced looking at them from very different perspectives. Um, <clears throat> our inaugural event was uh, a Disputatio in commemoration of the Disputatio of 1263, and it, take, um, it took place in the Salo de Seine uh, with philosopher Thomas Pogge and uh, neuroscientist uh, Mara Dirsen. And let me quickly tell you about two other activities that we're organizing here in the, with the Institut de Estudios Catalans uh, that may be of interest. Next week on Thursday, March 13th at 7 p.m., we will have a debate on neuroscience and economics. And we have invited Rosemary Nagel, Antonio Cabrales, and Arcadi Navarro to be uh, the, the people debating. And on July 16th, 17th, and 18th, we will have the annual conference of the Academia Europea in Barcelona. And the title of the conference is Young Europe, Realities, Dilemmas, and Opportunities for the New Generation. Um, if you just Google Barcelona Knowledge Hub, you will find our webpage, and then you can find other, or, or, all, the, all the activities that we, that we are organizing, and you can come to know more about the Barcelona Knowledge Hub and about the Academia Europea. But today we're here to celebrate International Women's Day, and it is um, now time for Merced Piqueras to introduce Nadia Lodi. Está, no? eh, bona tarda. Eh, per mi és un plaer presentar Nadia El Abadi aquí. Eh, vaig conèixer Nadia El Abadi quan ella era presidenta de la Federació Mundial de Periodisme Científic, una presidenta molt jove, eh, com podeu veure, perquè no fa, eh, no fa gaires anys, però com que encara és jove, doncs encara ho era més. Eh, i va organitzar el Congrés de, de Periodisme Científic que es va, s'havia de fer al Caire el 2011, però justament aquell any bueno, tots recordem què va passar a Egipte. Eh, jo vaig anar seguint els fets de la plaça Tahrir a través dels, dels tuits que enviava Nadia eh, i, i, i no sé, i vaig vaig poder, o sigui, podia seguir-ho què estava passant en aquell moment, o sigui, el que després ens deien les notícies, doncs ja, jo ja ho sé, bueno, jo i, molt, i els milers de persones que la seguien. Uh, era, abans en parlàvem d'això i com ella va explicar que una persona, un home, li va trencar la càmera de fotos i deia que per ella va ser un disgust grandíssim perquè deia, ella deia, era el, la manera com enviava el seu testimoni, a part dels tuits, era amb les fotos, era, diu, era com si eh, m'haguessin trencat una pluma i ja no pogués escriure, doncs el mateix li passava amb la càmera. Eh, de, no sé, a nadie se la pot presentar de moltes maneres perquè ella de formació és metge o sigui, és una persona eh, però s'ha dedicat al periodisme científic i, i, de, i, i va estar aquí en el, el 2011 després, aquell mateix any el mes de maig i va coincidir que quan hi havia aquí a la plaça Catalunya hi havia els, els aldarulls, bueno, aquell, també un moviment de protesta, el moviment dels indignats, i així. I va venir per fer una classe en el màster de comunicació científica de la Universitat Pompeu Fabra 
i vam tenir una reunió, vam organitzar una reunió amb membres de l'Associació Catalana de Comunicació Científica i estaven parlant, parlaven del descontent que hi havia i, no sé, algú li va dir que aquí també hi havia un gran descontent, però ella deia, però almenys vosaltres aquí us podeu queixar. Diu, allà no podíem. O sigui, el moviment aquell de revolta, sobretot, va ser perquè tenia, a més de tot el que estaven patint el poble, aquell poble, doncs estaven amordassats. Fins i tot van intentar, durant uns dies, quan estaven a la plaça Tahrir, es van tallar les comunicacions amb internet, però potser com que van veure que era que ja trobaven altres maneres d'enviar, doncs al final es van restablir. I va ser, jo crec que va marcar aquell moviment, aquella revolució, tot i que abans, tot havia començat abans, com ell ens explicarà, a Tunísia, però jo crec que en el cas d'Egipte va haver-hi un canvi, o sigui, es va veure la força que tenen les xarxes socials avui dia, en què per més censures que hi hagi, doncs hi ha coses que no es poden, o sigui, és allò que diuen que no se pot posar portes al campo, doncs així passa ara. Els nous mitjans permeten que tot el que està passant en un moment se sàpiga per tot el món. I crec que Nàdia va ser un testimoni excepcional també per un altre fet, pel fet de ser una dona. Jo voldria, no sé si ens ho explicarà, però si no després li preguntarem què ha representat per a les dones egípcies i àrabs en general aquest moviment que va començar una mica abans a Tunísia, però que a Egipte va ser el gener del 2011. No cal que us digui res més d'ella perquè també si heu vist en el web de l'Institut i els fulls que es van distribuir explica una miqueta la seva biografia. Ella té un blog que és molt interessant perquè explica un blog que jo dic que potser un home no l'hauria fet igual perquè Nàdia a més d'explicar el que veu explica el que sent també. Però ara deixem-la que sigui ella qui ens parli. Thank you for the introduction. I have no idea what was said, but I'm sure most of it was an exaggeration. I'm just a mother and um, a wife and someone who's trying to find her place in life. Um, not much more than that. Um, I'd like to thank my generous hosts for having me, the Institute for Catalan Studies and Academia Europea. Um, I'm very honored to be here today to speak to you um, about the situation in Egypt, it's a personal perspective. Uh, it's not a historical account, nor is it a political analysis. I am not in a position to be able to do either. <clears throat> I am in a position, however, to give you my personal account of what's been happening in Egypt over the past three years. For two months following the day the revolution ended, for it did end that day of February 11, 2011, when Mubarak was ousted, I felt completely incapable of going anywhere near Cairo's Tahrir Square, where so much happened during those 18 fateful days. Getting close to Tahrir would conjure up horrible memories, memories I needed to suppress. It was only the day after the revolution ended, on February 12, that I allowed myself to process what I had witnessed and experienced for just under a month. Gunshots, tear gas, Skies so full of rocks, they appeared as if they were suspended in midair. Injuries, deaths, how could all that have happened to me, my friends, and my fellow countrymen? I found the experience of putting together this talk very similar to my experience following the revolution. If I came too close to it, it conjured up memories I needed to suppress. More than once, I considered canceling this talk but every time I told myself that ours was a story that needed to be told, no matter how difficult, no matter how traumatizing, no matter how grim. It's difficult to find that point in history where a certain story starts. Anger had been simmering in Egyptian hearts for years. Demonstrations were regularly held, always small, always well controlled by Egypt's police force. 
Political activists went into and out of prison the way you put chewing gum into your mouth and then spit it out. That was the only Egypt we ever knew. Sometimes normal Egyptians like me would take notice. Other times we would feel bored of the same old story and just move on with our lives. Things were hard enough as they were for us to worry about other people's lives. That is exactly what many people believe Mubarak's regime was banking on. Keep the people overwhelmed with finding their daily bread and they will not have the energy or the time to get involved in politics. If that was the plan, it worked for decades. But nearing the end of 2010, too many events came, one after the other, that brought a critical mass of Egyptians to boiling point. There were abundant rumors that Mubarak's son, Gamal, was planning to run for presidency. Many Egyptians loudly opposed what was referred to as inheriting the presidency in Egypt. In February of 2010, the former International Atomic Energy Agency director, General, the Director General Mohammed al Baradai, returned to Egypt and, together with opposition figures and activists, formed a coalition for political change. The coalition found much support among younger Egyptians. On June 6th of 2010, Khalid Saeed, a 28 year old man from Alexandria, was arrested on dubious charges of theft and possession of weapons. Witnesses reported that the police beat him to death. The police claim he died from swallowing a packet of hashish. Four days later, on June 10, 2010, the We Are All Khalid Saeed Facebook page launched, protesting against Saeed's death and demanding justice. It rapidly gained hundreds of thousands of followers. The page rapidly turned into an all-out campaign against police brutality and human rights abuses in Egypt. On November 24, 2010, Coptic Christians clashed with, clashed with police in Giza over the construction of a church complex. The government had issued an order to halt its construction. On the 28th of November and the 5th of De December in 2010, Egyptian parliamentary elections were held Although, in my opinion, this particular election was not any more fraudulent than so many others before it, it was well covered by social media activists and transgressions were well document and documented and publicized, helping, again in my own opinion, to build a national disgruntlement with Mubarak's regime. The Muslim Brotherhood failed to win a single seat in this election, even though it held a fifth of the places in the pre previous parliament. Um, on December 17th of 2010, in Tunisia, a street vendor, Mohammed Bouazizi, set himself on fire. The municipality had confiscated the cart on which he sold fruits and vegetables. He was slapped by a female police officer, and the muni muni municipality refused to receive the complaint he lodged against her. He died from his burns several days later. In December of 2010, on the 24th, demonstrations started in Tunisia and spread. On the 30th of December, we, the We Are All Khalid Saeed Facebook page posted the first known mention of an idea to hold protests in Egypt on police day, January 25th. On the 1st of January, there was a bomb blast that killed 21 in a church in Alexandria where Christians had gathered to mark the new year. On the 14th of January, the Tunisian president Zain al-Abidin bin Ali fled the country, and then calls for protests on, in Egypt on January 25 gained momentum um, and apparent public support. My friend Arwa and I had seen all the calls for demonstrations to be held on police day on January 25, but we were very skeptical it would result in anything. We had seen so many similar calls in the previous months and years, they had rarely amounted to little more than a few people gathering on the street. I personally attended many demonstrations in Egypt since I was a university student. I even organized a demonstration when I was in university. Demonstrations organized by students within university grounds were usually quite impressive, but they were almost always contained within the walls of the university, 
where they were relatively safe from police harassment. Up until January 25, 2011, I had never personally seen a demonstration outside of a university that involved more than 100 to 200 participants. My friend Arwa and I thought the January 25 demonstration would be like all the others. We went anyways. It was a holiday. We had time on our hands, and you never know. And it was there that we started what will probably prove to be the most momentous event of our lives. On Tuesday, January 25, thousands of people took to the streets of Cairo and marched through its downtown area. I had never seen anything of the sort in Cairo. The demonstrators were just normal people. Besides a small number of flags belonging to the weft party at the beginning of the demonstrations that day, I saw no identifying elements that would say that these people belonged to one organization or party or another. They were just people, thousands of them. People protesting against police brutality, people pro protesting for better health care, people protesting for a better life, and some starting to chant, down with Mubarak. Arwa and I were elated to see that the Egyptian people had woken up. We could hardly believe it. Clashes happened that first day between the protesters and the police, but by the end of the day, the people had taken over Tahrir Square in the center of the city for a brief period of time. Some demonstrations happened the following Wednesday and Thursday, but they were work days, and most people, including myself, went to work those days. I decided that if the spirit continued, I would demonstrate on Friday, January 28, 2011, the first Friday is the first day of the Egyptian weekend. On Friday, many Egyptians died. It was probably one of the most horrific days in recent Egyptian history. It is a day that cannot be wiped from my memory. <clears throat> the police directed gunshots directly at protesters. They drove over them with their trucks. Thousands of people were tear gassed over and over and over again. Millions of people eventually raided Tahrir Square, and the police from thence on receded into one spot of the Ministry of Interior in the downtown area, where clashes continued until February 11. The story of our revolution is one that would take long to tell. Suffice to say that during those 18 days, I saw death, I saw injuries, I saw passion, I saw compassion, I saw pain, I saw fear, I saw joy, joy. Many days when I left my father's home near Tahrir Square, where I was staying at the time to make it easier for me to participate in the revolution, I did not, did not know if I would live to return. My elderly father would say, God be with you, to his two adult daughters as they left into the unknown. All he could do was to follow the events on the television set and try to call us every now and then to make sure we were, all, we were all right. He couldn't always get through to us. In the beginning of the revolution, the Egyptian government shut down all forms of communication and internet con connectivity. Most other days, it was just impossible to reach anyone in Tahrir Square uh, because the mobile networks were overloaded. What I learned during those days was that one's country is a very precious thing. It can be, in certain circumstances, the most precious thing. During those 18 days, I knew that we were at a moment in time in which we could potentially create real change. We could make life better for our children and for their children. And for that to happen, we were willing to face death. I was asked by international media so many times during the revolution, if you manage to remove Mubarak, what happens next? My reply was always, I don't know. We have a dictator on our hands. He must be removed. What comes after that will be a very difficult road. But it is a road we must go down if we want our country to eventually get better. Perhaps one or two months after the revolution, I found myself writing in a Facebook status, after the cleansing rains, the creepy crawlies come out of their holes. 
The revolution was like a cleansing rain for Egypt, or so many of us thought at the time. But it took only a short period of time for more corruption, much of it in the form of intellectually corrupted minds, to appear on the surface. A struggle began over who was going to take control of the country once the army let go. And much of that struggle was a power struggle over the minds of the Egyptian people. So much happened in Egypt in the three years that followed the revolution. We had constitutional referendums, parliamentary elections, presidential elections, messy and ridiculous parliamentary discussions, the dissolution of parliament, governments appointed, governments removed, court cases held against suspects for killing protesters, against Mubarak, against his minister of interior, against his sons, against other members of his government. No one held accountable for protesters' deaths, civilians thrown into military prisons, virginity checks on female activists sent to prison, protests, deaths, more protests, more deaths, and finally the ouster, with the support of the army, of a democratically elected president. There is no easy way to explain the complexity of it all. There is no easy way to understand it, if there is a way at all. What I want to talk to you about today is what all that meant for an ordinary Egyptian like myself. I was left traumatized after the revolution ended, not in any major way, but what we had taken part in and what we had witnessed, well, it was not easy. Nevertheless, more than traumatized, I felt hopeful after the revolution. Our country was going to, be, was going to change for the better. My children would have a better future. Their children, children would have an even better future. It would take years and years, I knew. But we had started the process, and I was proud to have been part of it. I followed very closely the discussions around the constitutional referendum that was held in the following March 19, 2011 just over a month after Mubarak was removed. I was not happy with how some of the discussions were tailored. Vote yes for the constitutional amendments and you vote yes to stability. Vote yes and you vote yes to Islam. I was a no voter. I wasn't happy with some of the details in the amendments. I did not believe we should have rushed changes to our constitution. We needed to do this right. How we changed our constitution would set up our country for what was to come. I was, in the end, among the minor minority. The majority did vote yes for the constitutional amendments. I was unhappy that it appeared to me that people had voted yes not because they agreed to the details of the amendments, but because they wanted to move on with the process and get a parliament and a president in place regardless of the details. We had fought and died for democracy. The vote of the majority would need to be respected. Nevertheless, I felt concern for what was to come. In the months that followed, revolutionaries called for many protests. I took part in none. It was not clear to me what we would stand to gain from such protests. My personal view was that I played my role as a revolutionary from January 25 to February 11. That was something I could do. It was now time for people like me to step aside and to let the politicians take over the process of building our country. I do not understand politics. I also do not have the thick skin needed for politics. At the same time, this political process, I felt, needed stability. I was worried that revolutionaries had become addicted to the adrenaline rush of revolting. I was worried that revolutionaries were not considering tools other than revolting in order to voice their opinions, Protests in the following months inevitably resulted in clashes with the police and the military, which inevitably resulted in injuries and deaths. Cairo was becoming more chaotic and unstable than it normally was. There were many times during those months and the years that followed when I was not sure whether it was safe to put my children on the school bus to go to school. Clashes sometimes broke out all night in areas where their school bus passes through to reach their school. I have a horrible memory of staying up one night, watching the events of a protest unfold on live television. People were getting shot and dying. Tear gas was everywhere. My sister and my best friend 
Both live in the direct area where this was happening. While I had the television on at the same time, I was on the phone with my sister and with my best friend, learning more about what was happening and making sure they were both safe. I spent the whole night trying to figure out if this was going to be a protest that would settle down by dawn or if it was something that would continue into the following day. My children would have to pass through that area to get to school the next day. In the end, I kept them home with me the next day. As the politics unfolded in Egypt, we had no choice but to try to go on living our everyday lives. I remember as a young woman, I tried to understand how people I knew were able to continue living in Beirut during Lebanon's 25 years of civil war. They would tell me that they would be sleeping in their homes and there would be gunfights or bombs blasting outside their windows. And they would just keep, go back to sleep after they heard that. In the morning, they would go to work and tiptoe over the rubble left by the fights from the previous night. They talked about it as if it was normal. I just couldn't comprehend. I do comprehend now. No matter the situation, humans are given an incredible capacity to move on. During the revolution itself, fear was not my most overwhelming emotion. Determination was. From January 25 onwards until today, there have been many occasions when I have been directly exposed to gunfire or to tear gas. When I hear gunfire while I'm inside my home, I wake up because of the noise, and then I just go back to sleep. The logic is that there's nothing I can do about it now. I know that I'm safe within my home. I need to sleep because I have work the next day. So I go to sleep. We become accustomed, or we became accustomed in Cairo to having violent demonstrations every Friday for months, years even. Instead of staying home, most Egyptians would just go out and enjoy their weekend, avoiding the areas where demonstrations were happening. We have a good system to know which areas to avoid. Social media plays a major role in this. In addition to checking the news on our television sets, we also check our Twitter and Facebook feeds. A large number of Egyptians use both. Egyptians generally have quite large social networks of friends, acquaintances, and people we follow. When something happens somewhere, we'll know. We also have traffic apps on our mobile phones that tell us where traffic is seriously held up. Sometimes these apps even tell you why it is held up. By using all of this information, many of us are able to live our lives normally by avoiding that which is abnormal. It can be difficult, with this being the case, to figure out who is living in the real bubble. Is it people like me who try to go on living their lives despite the troubles? Or is it people who are in the midst of the troubles who go on trying to create change in the way they think is best while the rest of the city goes on living their lives? To drive this concept home, I'll give you a recent example. Last November, this 2013, I had taken my children out for dinner and then to a movie. It was a Friday afternoon, and that was our Friday family ritual. On our way home, as we were driving into my neighborhood, we saw many people standing on the side of the road facing in one direction. They were looking at something I couldn't see. My eldest daughter was driving. I was teaching her how to drive before she took her driver's license test. I told her to stop, and I opened the window and asked one of the people standing on the side of the road what was happening. He said there were clashes just ahead and that they had heard gunfire. This was in the direct vicinity of my house. We heard noises. We don't know if they were gunshots or firecrackers. Firecrackers are commonly used in protests to frighten people. But I yelled at my daughter. I yelled at her to get out now and sit in the passenger seat, and then I took over the driving. I quickly backed the car into a side street, got to our house using a couple of back streets instead of our normal route. I stopped quickly in front of our apartment building and yelled at the children to get out, 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 up to the house, stay away from the windows. I took the car to the garage just a bit further down the street. It was very dangerous to keep a car outside during circumstances like this. Rocks are thrown, windows are broken. Cars are used as shields. Sometimes they are turned over, other times they are put up in flames. Once I knew my children were safe, it was time for me to try to figure out what was happening. 
I walked back into one of the larger roads. I saw young men carrying large sticks, chains, and even swords. I stopped one of them and asked what was happening. He told me that the Muslim Brotherhood were demonstrating on the main street and that he and other neighborhood men were trying to stop them from coming into the neighborhood. I could tell that clashes were happening ahead, but I dared not move further. I stayed for a little while, things started to calm down, and I headed home. This was a common scene all over Cairo. There was a rising sense of anti-brotherhood sentiment among the general population that did not cease with Mursi's removal. Even if the brotherhood demonstrations are not violent, many people have very bad feelings towards them and expect violence from them. When demonstrations head into a neighborhood, shops are shut and many young men in that neighborhood gather together every weapon they own and will sometimes physically clash with the demonstrators in order to prevent them from proceeding further. This situation is even more scary than the more organized clashes that happen between protesters and police. It is impossible to discern who is whom when civilians fight against civilians. It is impossible to tell who started what. People die because other people decide on a whim that they are dangerous and deserve to be stopped. We have been living in a very lawless city. I was in the UK during the summer of 2013, last summer. When I'm in Egypt, I watch events unfold through social media and the television set. Every now and then, I unwillingly become part of an event myself, such as the one I just described. When I'm away from Egypt, I follow the events through social media and television. The only difference is that I cannot personally and physically end up being part of an unfolding event. The same does not apply to my family members and friends who are still in Egypt. On June 30th, 2013, I was horrified as I watched millions of Egyptians take to the streets, demanding that President Morsi be removed. During the run-up to the June 30 protests, I was using social media to do everything in my power to persuade friends and followers that trying to remove a democratically elected president by force was only going to make matters worse for our country. The June 30 protesters had legitimate grievances. President Morsi had given himself constitutional powers that a very large number of people did not agree with. Very large numbers of Egyptians protested against this when it happened. Mursi had appointed consultants who were leaving him one after the other because he was not listening to their consultations. In some cases, he wasn't even consulting them. In June 2013, Mursi appointed Islamist allies in 13 of Egypt's 27 governorates. The governor appointed to Luxor once belonged to an Islamist group that was linked to the massacre of tourists in Luxor in 1997. There was talk about the Brotherhood-led government rearranging the boundaries of electorates in a way that would give Brotherhood members a stronger chance of winning in future elections. The Egyptian people had legitimate reason to be concerned. In my opinion, they had legitimate reason to want to remove Morsi. The question was, what was the best way to go about this for the country? It is important to note that there is another side to the story. Even though Morsi was president, he had virtually no control over the police, the army, or the judiciary. In his speeches, he frequently mentioned, much to the amusement of many Egyptians, conspiracies that were happening behind the scenes to remove him. None of us doubted this to be the case. What Egyptians have referred to as the deep state from Mubarak's time continued to thrive. We knew this. We knew we had only managed to remove the head of that regime. We had not even managed to bring him properly to justice. The deep state would surely be strate strategically planning ways to oust Morsi or anyone else who might have been in his place and retake power. Mursi and the Brotherhood-led government found themselves in an almost impossible situation. Anyone else elected to the presidency would have found themselves in the same position. Mursi's reaction was to turn inward to the Brotherhood that he knew and trusted. 
In my view, one of his biggest mistakes was not that he gave himself, himself constitutional powers. It was not that he mistrusted his consultants. It was not that he appointed Islamist allies as governors. Morsi's biggest mistake was his lack of transparency with the Egyptian people. Had he, in one of his many very long public speeches, plainly explained the obstacles that were being placed in his path in order to create a stable Egypt, he might have had more support from those that really mattered, the Egyptian people. But there was no transparency. Mursi simply did in his speeches what so many Egyptians commonly do when they're sitting over coffee and talking. He talked generally and vaguely about information that had reached him that certain people were making plans against him. In one speech, he laughably named the names of some thugs in some, Cairo's in, uh, some neighborhoods in Cairo who were creating havoc. Instead of telling the Egyptian people about the specific problems he faced with the police, the army, and the judiciary, he continuously made public statements supporting them and raising them on a pedestal. Clearly, his strategy was to win them over this way, but it wasn't working and his hands were tied. So much so that when protests happened just outside the presidential palace at one point during his presidency, he was unable to depend on the protection of the police. The result being calls from the brotherhood to their members to protect the palace and the president themselves. This resulted in very bloody and deadly clashes between protesters and Brotherhood members. Mursi and the Brotherhood handled the entirety of the political situation horribly. In my view, their lack of public transparency was their downfall. So many revolutionaries were furious. Opposition parties were furious. Egyptians were furious. And understandably, the not insignificant number of Egyptians who were pro-Mubarak or anti-Brotherhood saw this as their chance to remove their opponent. In the run-up to the June 30 protests, for weeks, there had been gasoline shortages and electricity cuts. Gasoline shortages meant that vehicles would stand for hours in long lines in front of gas stations for when gas actually did become available. Not only did this mean that people had to take days off of work, uh, to make sure that their cars had fuel or that taxi drivers lost income because they had to frequently lose a day of work to get fuel, but it also meant that the streets of Cairo were bottlenecked at gas stations in so many places that movement on the city streets had virtually come to a standstill in some places. As for the electricity cuts, it meant that people could not use air conditioners in the hot summer months of Cairo. It meant that families were sitting in the dark for hours more importantly, for many, it meant there was no running water because so many apartment buildings in the city depend on electric water pumps to pump the water up to their apartments or to water tanks that are on the tops of buildings. Egyptians were never given logical explanations as to why we had these severe gasoline shortages and electricity cuts. I suspect, as do many others, that it was part of a plan to make life hell for Egyptians so that they would blame Morsi and his government, thus expediting his removal. Life was indeed hell. The lack of transparency on behalf of Morsi and his government made people even more angry. He may very well have been trying to manage the situation behind the scenes, but Egyptians felt they deserved an explanation, one that made sense. People wanted the man gone, by force if need be. It worked with Mubarak, it should work with Morsi. The difference though, in my opinion, was that Mubarak was a 30-year-long dictator who was not really chosen by the people. Mursi, on the other hand, came into power as a result of a revolution followed by democratic elections. He had only been in power for one year. For so many people, he was not the best choice. He was the only choice. His opponent in the presidential elections was a former Mubarak minister. Do you choose a former Mubarak man or a Muslim Brotherhood man? It was like choosing between two evils for so many people. Even so, there was a significant portion of the Egyptian population who chose Morsi because they truly supported him and the Muslim Brotherhood. I told friends and followers through social media to think things through. What happens if you forcibly remove Morsi? Then what? Who takes over? It's going to be the army. Are we in a position to trust the army more than we trust Morsi? 
Will they not give themselves even more powers than Morsi gave himself? How will they leave for us to get someone else in their place? Can we trust that person when he comes? Will he do any better than Morsi has done? Then, if the Brotherhood is forcibly removed, will they not be termed, turned into victims? They will be pursued, and they will get sympathy. As someone who did not approve of the Brotherhood's handling of the country, or of their own organization for that matter, I was willing to wait for their term to end and to hold democratic elections afterwards to bring someone else in. The Brotherhood were shooting themselves in the foot. They were proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that they did not have the necessary competence to govern our country. country. That would mean that there was a good chance they would not succeed in the next elections. If they were forcibly removed, I believed, they could regain some public sim sympathy because they would become victims. We needed to give democracy a, ch a chance, I believed. As a people, there was a need for us to look into the future and calculate the results of the actions we took. We needed to figure out what was best for the country in the long run, not in the next few days, weeks, or years. I was not, of course, the only one who thought this way. Many of my revolutionary friends thought the same. But too many Egyptians did not, including many revolutionaries. They wanted Morsi gone. They trusted the army once, so they believed they could trust them again. They wanted the country to have stability. I watched horrified from my TV set in the UK and from my computer screen as millions of people took to the streets on June 30th, 2013. Every indication was that they were supported wholeheartedly by the army. I was terrified by what this all meant for the future of my country and for what I felt was our newfound democracy, however stunted it may have been. The short story we all know is that Morsi was removed from power and the military took charge of the country. On the ground, Egyptians were divided. Social media was rife with people posing views and counter views. Arguments ensued. People felt so strongly about their opinions of what had happened and what needed to happen that they were losing friends. People were falling out with their own mothers, fathers, and siblings. The Muslim Brotherhood then began huge sit-ins in two parts of Cairo that caused much disruption to normal life and to traffic. As I watched the events unfold, my concerns for my family in Cairo grew. My children joined me in the UK in the middle of June, some 15 days before the June 30 protests. Having them with me safe in the UK was a huge relief. But my sister, a single mother of one, was living alone in Cairo with her daughter within walking distance from one of the two Brotherhood sit-ins. Because of her location near the center of Cairo, she had already been witness to almost daily troubles. The city generally was becoming very unsafe. Burglaries were on the rise. There were many reports of people being held up by gunpoint while in their cars on a major throughway in Cairo to give up the money and values, valuables that they had with them. One of my former work colleagues had a sister who was a mother of one teenage daughter who was shot in the head while she was driving through a crowded part of Cairo just so they could steal the money she had in her car. My sister wrote on a Facebook status in July saying she was crossing the street in front of her house when two men on a motorcycle swept by, the one in the back pointing a gun somewhere behind him. Expectations, rumors, and even army threats all pointed to the fact that the Brotherhood sit-ins were going to be violently dispersed. One day, my sister told me of protests that had reached her street. Cars were overturned and set on fire. Her car was among the lucky few that were spared. My sister was due to visit me in the UK for a short time that summer, but my brothers and I, my brothers live in the United States, we got together and we told her that she needed to change her plans and to come to the UK earlier. We were not happy with her being alone in Cairo in that neighborhood at such a deadly time. She arrived with her daughter to the UK on July 11. On August 14, the army and police invaded the Brotherhood sit-ins and hundreds, if not more, were violently killed. My sister and I followed the event from the UK in horror. A former work colleague of mine, <clears throat> a 
one of the most gentle and kind men one could ever know, was killed. Almost every friend I knew had a friend or a family member who died. It wasn't only Brotherhood members who were in these sit-ins. Many people who were against the forceful removal of a democratically elected president, whether they supported him personally or not, were regularly visiting, uh, visiting these sit-ins. My sister and I spent the day crying almost uncontrollably. What was more hurtful, possibly, than the fact that so many people were getting killed was the fact that we were seeing so many Egyptians supporting the violent dispersal. Things like they're getting what they deserve were being said by a significant number of people. Some people were visibly happy that the sit-ins were being dispersed in this matter. Some people were even celebrating. For me, my sister, and for so many others, the killings were one thing. The celebrations of those killings by fellow Egyptians was another thing altogether. <clears throat> we were heartbroken by our own countrymen. We felt helpless. We lost trust in the people of our country to think and to act like human beings. We felt very insecure. My family immediately got together to send my sister and her daughter to live with my brothers in the United States. The situation in Egypt had created a sense of intense anxiety among us. We needed to know that my sister and my niece would be safe, even though she had no home in the United States, no work and no definite prospect of work there. She and her daughter left the UK to the United States. It has been and continues to be a difficult journey for my sister, but she has the help and support of our family to make things work, and she is gradually establishing herself in a new country. When I married my husband, Colin, back there, at the end of 2011, the year of the revolution, our plan was that we would move to Cairo. Even though the situation in Egypt was not the best, we all still had hope that with time, Egypt would prosper. As the weeks and months went by, it became clear that Egypt was moving towards an instability that would make life for Colin there very difficult. We had political insecurity. The general security situation was worsening each day. We had an economic instability. Uh, how could I ask my husband to leave the secure job, home, and life he had in his country to come to live in a completely insecure Egypt? The result has been that Colin continues to live in the UK. I have spent the first two years of our marriage traveling back and forth between my children in Egypt and my husband in the United Kingdom. I have had to give up my work to do this. My children now travel back and forth between the two countries as well. Because they are older, it, is, it has proven almost impossible for us to consider taking them out of their schools in Egypt uh, to put them in schools in the United Kingdom. My eldest daughter is already in university. There is no way I or her father could afford sending them uh, to a university in England. My other children are in their final years of education. Switching the educational systems would probably mean losing a year or two of education for them. And even if we did that, how would we manage to give them a university education in the UK, something both their parents believe they deserve to have? So I feel as if my children are stuck in that country, and I am stuck in limbo between countries. So many of my friends have been leaving Egypt in the past year. A few of them worked for Al Jazeera, which has been accused, wrongly or rightly, of working too closely with the Brotherhood. From my personal point of view and from what I have seen, Al Jazeera was the only channel I could turn to if I wanted to know the Brotherhood perspective on events in Egypt. I was also able to get other perspective on, on events from Al Jazeera. I had become unable, however, to get Brotherhood perspectives on any other Egyptian channel. Journalist friends who worked with Al Jazeera were threatened. The apartment of a friend of mine who was a journalist at Al Jazeera was burned down twice by thugs. Luckily, neither he nor his family were in the apartment at the time. He and many Al Jazeera journalists have chosen to go live in Qatar. Other Al Jazeera journalists have been thrown in jail in Egypt. One of my friends left Egypt after his brother-in-law was killed in the Brotherhood sit-in. He could not bear the way Egyptians were treating their own countrymen. 
Many other friends have left Egypt because they feel hopeless. They risked so much for their country to be better, and now, not only is it getting worse, it seems there is significant public support for military rule. Yet others have left because they want to live somewhere they can have better security and education for their children. Egyptians are now very divided after having been very unified only three years earlier. One group talks about the need for Egyptians to be ruled with an iron hand. Another group talks about the need for democracy with all the instability it may bring. All indications are that the current head of Egypt's military, General Sisi, will run for presidency and will win. He has a huge public, even cult-like following. To people like me, it seems like the main focus of many Egyptians is on the food in their bellies and the hope of a relatively stable country. How the country is run, whether we have a democracy or a dictatorship, whether human rights are upheld, does not really make much of a difference as long as none of it affects the way they go about their daily lives. In the meantime, as we speak, my children's midterm holidays have been extended from being only two weeks long to being a month and a half long. The government has probably been postponing sending students back to schools and to universities in order to prevent students from organizing protests. The real result is that my children are not getting the education they deserve. Our prognosis as a country seems very grim. We are looking down a gun barrel at military rule. The main issues that our country faces, those same issues that led to a revolution, remain and have become even worse. Police brutality is rampant. Justice is hard to come by. Security on the ground is bad. The economic situation is crumbling. Corruption is widespread. Healthcare is in the dumps. Education needs a complete revamp. Human rights and freedoms are severely lacking. Press freedoms are almost non-existent. For someone like me, it almost feels like there is no hope and that there is nothing that I can do to change things. Egyptian society is so divided at this stage that it seems impossible for people to come together again to create change. Nevertheless, my friends and I continue to give each other pep talks through social media. Things are bad now, we say, but we can work little by little to make them better. We need to create awareness. That takes years. We need to put in the time and the effort. So we go on living our lives, mainly frustrated with how things turned out, and trying very, very hard to be hopeful that we can somehow change things around. Perhaps not now. Perhaps our children will create a more permanent change. For now, we have a story to tell of an unfulfilled revolution. We have lessons learned and others that we still need to learn. We have memories, good and bad, and we have personal lives to build. And we have a country that needs saving. However that might be, whenever it might be, it will happen in our lifetime or in someone else's. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, you would like to, to ask her a question is if you speak uh, uh, in Catalan, I will translate or merci, merci, come here also over there and uh, we translate for that. So, is there uh, alguna pregunta for Nadia? Necesitemos un micrófono. Es que no se cena ya al final y no, no es grave. Es que y es que no, no es grave, se está grabando. No sé. Le puedes preguntar en inglés, sí. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Paula, and I'm studying journalism in Barcelona. 
And my question is, how did you live that, being a woman, but also being a journalist? I mean, it, it mustn't be easy to you to, I don't know, to live this and to report this in the media. And I don't know how, how it is to be a woman and to be a journalist in a conflict like this. There were, um, there were times, but most of the time during the revolution itself in 2011, <clears throat> um, women generally, and the journalists specifically, um, were not finding problems because of their gender. <clears throat> this is in the revolution itself. There were times when journalists specifically were targeted, whether they were men or women, um, but targeted either to confiscate their cameras so that they wouldn't be witness to events, or targeted, um, meaning that uh, sometimes uh, people would be placed within Tahrir Square uh, to, to say negative things about these journalists as if they were not who they actually are, and to create some sort of a public um, upset about them. And then the, the, the mob mentality, when it's, when it's created, people don't think about what they're doing, and they don't think about what's being said, and whether it's fact or whether it's fiction. So they'd place, the Egyptian government would place people within the square to try to get this mob mentality to work against journalists so that they wouldn't be able to properly report. So this was against journalists in specific. Um, <clears throat> there were times um, during the revolution, but then it increased afterwards, where women in particular were very severely harassed in the most horrific ways you can imagine. Um, it was actually not a problem in the, in the beginning during the revolution. And one of the, I remember, I recall, recall very clearly on, it was the January 28th, the very horrible day where so many people were killed because of the clashes with the police. I remember that night saying to my friend that we're women walking in the midst of all of this and nobody has touched us, nobody has harassed us, nobody has said a bad word to us, that we felt that this was the true Egyptian spirit that changed later. And um, now many women find it very difficult, not even just within the revolutionary, sorry, within the revolutionary um, uh, spirit or within the revolutionary concept, but also just walking in the streets. Harassment is a major issue uh, for women. Uh, I, I've personally never had to deal with that. I'm, I'm, I've been very fortunate. I, I was targeted as a journal or as someone holding a camera um, while I was uh, filming. Um, if, you, if you followed the events, there was something we call the Day of the Camels, when uh, camels marched into Tahrir Square uh, with pro Mubarak men on them. Um, that day, I, I was filming that as it happened, and a thug pounced on me and broke my camera so that I couldn't film the events. Uh, but that was the kind of thing that happened. Nothing, I didn't get anything specifically because I was a woman. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? <coughs> In Geneva. Never Thank you. Um, I just, um, I realize that your, your account is a very personal account. Yes. But I just wanted to raise an abstract question because this is something that occurs to me listening to what you're saying. And um, it's, the, it's the question about, it's an ethical question, right? Um, a government that has been elected democratically, you know, for you, the difference between the earlier government and the government that people were protesting against later is the fact that this one has been elected democratically. And sure, I mean, that makes a difference. but. The point is, when you think about the way in which the media um, uh, manage to, to just um, form opinion, the way in which, you know, there are, there are people who are consultants who know how to form opinion, people vote in ways that are very uninformed, it gets to a point in which you start thinking, um, what, or, or when you think, for instance, that, that, that Hitler was elected democratically after all, right? 
Um, what kind of conditions would you think that we should place in order for, in, in order to think that it is legitimate to try to overthrow a government that has been democratically elected, it's, right? It cannot be that it has been democratically elected. Maybe unnecessary, but it's you know, just a sufficient condition for the government to be legitimate, right? So I, I wanted to know your thoughts about that. I, I don't have an answer to that question. It's a, that's a very difficult question to answer, and I, I would assume that if you asked, uh, you know, a, a political analyst the same question, someone that actually understood politics as opposed to me, who never understood politics, I would assume that they wouldn't have a good answer to that question either. I really, really don't know. Because if you do compare the two situations, Mubarak was removed by public revolt, and Morsi was removed as well by public revolt. There is a little bit of a difference in that the public revolt um, against Morsi lasted for 18 days, and it would have continued. The revolt against Morsi was one day, it was June 30th. Um, and it would appear that it was used, the fact that there was enough momentum to get that many people out onto the streets for whatever reason, for that one day it was used to remove the man without giving it enough chance to see, if, is this going to be something that would die out or is it something that would continue? Um, is this a difference? It might be. Is this to, to have continuous public demand rather than demand one day? Because in Egypt, for the past three years, um, uh, it has been possible that you'd get thousands possibly millions of people on the streets sometimes. Um, but it, it, they're usually very short-lived in the past three years. This was short-lived. It was only June 30th. Um, I think that's a difference that needs to be taken into consideration in this particular case. Well, as uh, your work is or has been a science journalism, uh, do you, have you seen any change in science journalism after the revolution in Egypt? No, not really. Um, science, uh, science journalism in Egypt is actually, it's, it's been doing quite well for several years. Um, we have a strong community of science journalists, they're very well skilled. Uh, many of them um, do work at an international level. Um, and they've continued to do that work through the revolution and afterwards. Um, they've been doing very well at reporting how and how, how things have been changing and how they haven't been changing, what needs to be done more since the revolution. So I, I, I couldn't say that there's been any, I, I've noticed any specific change because of the revolution. I think they've continued to, their, to do their work. They've been um, protected from the problems that other journalists who cover politics have been facing in our country. Mm. Um, uh, there's the, the media, we've got two different kinds of media in Egypt right now. We've got a, the propaganda machine, which is a very, mm. very large propaganda machine. The media is being used very well um, by different, uh, mainly by the people in position of power uh, to to create a certain mindset within the country. Um, and then you have what I would think is a much smaller number of professional journalists who cover events um, in a balanced way without, ha without showing biases. And um, those journalists are the ones that are targeted by uh, the powers that be in Egypt. And many of them have been thrown in jail. Some have died. Um, during, uh, while they covered protests. Um, and that's, that's been a big problem for journalists. The science journalists have been protected from that. And uh, for science, before uh, your lecture, we were talking about the library of Alexandria. And uh, those uh, institutions, there ha have uh, there been any changes in those institutions or universities or so? Um, there are some changes in, in academic institutions and they, they go back and forth. Um, university staff have been asking for more independence uh, when it comes to 
being able to uh, appoint uh, heads of universities and when it comes to being able to appoint uh, their, their deans. Um, these, in many cases, before it used to be appointment by the president. Um, university staff want to have their independence from this. They've, they gained it to a certain degree after the revolution. Um, also, but, it, but it's been an ongoing process. There's still so much more that needs to be gained. Um, one of the things that universities struggled with during Mubarak's time was that there was always a police force with, uh, located within university walls. Um, uh, after the revolution, these were removed, um, and now they've returned again. And so there's been a lot of back and forth with institutions, with especially the academic institutions in Egypt. A little bit of gain, and a little bit of loss, and a little bit of gain, and a little bit of loss. Um, and they just continue to, to try to do their best. And as I said, the problem that we have right now, or one of the problems, is that um, university uh, and school education has been suspended for the past month and a half. They started out with a two-week holiday, and now it's been a month and a half. Um, and that's usually to prevent students from organizing protests. Thank you. I, I have a twofold question. First, <clears throat> if you compare situation on women, professional women, I mean, uh, 10 years ago, with the old regime, not in the crisis, and with the present, the after revolution, which is the difference between the situation of women, you change or you are certainly the same, but this is the first. Mm. And the second, if you compare the situation in Egypt and you compare with the uh, situation, let's say in the Mediterranean, from Moroccan women, from Tunisian women, Algerian women, Lebanese women, which is the situation that you consider that in Egypt is the most advanced situation or the, in the middle, or which is the, the best um, Arabic county to be a woman? Mm. Okay. Um, the situation in Egypt for women in general, I would say, hasn't changed much. That's not necessarily a horrible thing because women have always, in my opinion, we've had a I'd say a relatively good situation compared to many other Arab countries. Um, but there is much room for improvement for women in, in Egypt. And what I've heard other women say repeatedly is that what the revolution has done is not, it's, it hasn't changed the situation, but it has changed the mindsets of women. And it's not just the mindsets of women, but it's the mindsets of youth, generally, that's changed. Um, we're in an age where people are more exposed to the internet, to satellite television, to the world, to knowledge, to information. Um, that's one of the reasons um, why we were able to have this revolution in 2011, because we have this youth that has been exposed to other ideas, and they want something different from what we've had. Um, Women, as part of that, have been part of that change in the mindset. And um, they're, they're, they're more able to express themselves. They're more able to, um, to decide on what their needs are and what they need to see change. Um, and I think that's where the main change has happened since the revolution, with women and with youth in general. Um, compare us with other Arab countries. Egyptian women are, are do, have been doing pretty well for quite some time. Um, I think in Tunisia it's the same, and it all ha a lot of it has to do with the state of education um, in in our countries. Um, there are other Arab countries where the state of education is not as high as in Egypt and, and as in Tunisia, um, where the women the women's situation is not as strong, and it's not just the women. I I, I usually don't think that the focus needs to be on one gender in particular because when one gender in particular has a problem, when, when you look at it, you'll find that it's both genders that have problems, it's, it's the society that has problems. Um, and so just as women in Morocco may have problems, men in Morocco will have problems as well. Uh, and a lot of it, in my opinion, has to do with the education systems. Um, of course, the, we have the Gulf countries that are getting more um, 
education and more science, but yet still are very um, uh, controlled by a closed culture. Um, and, but, but little by little, these things are changing as our societies open up more into the world and we have more access to information. Um, are human, including married and single, taking uh, pills, controlling the natality? In, in general, taking are they controlling uh, methods of birth, birth control? control? Is it, do they take is birth it, control? In, yeah, in, we don't in, have in, that in problem. Western, in yeah, a Western no, no, country, we, we have it uh, no, very we, frequent, yeah. No, no, well, birth control is not, is, uh, it's, it's not a problem in Islam. Women take birth control and they have been taking birth control. That's, mm. not, it, that's not one of our issues in, in any part of the Arab world. I know it's an issue in, within, uh, in the Catholic faith. Yeah. faith. It's not yeah. in Islam. We don't pay any attention, but well, it's an yeah. issue. <laughs> no, but it's not an issue in Islam. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Celia? Well, thanks for coming and giving this nice talk. Um, I was thinking, I mean, is, is it just a comment, no? About the power of the networking and the information that, that made possible at the very beginning, no? To change things that uh, it, means it seems impossible and to convince thousands of people to go out there and try to change in one direction. And this is a big power and then you can manage and you were happy no, about that at the begin very beginning. And then we have the same tools, but you cannot use these tools to get stability. And uh, I mean, this in, in, in ecology, <laughs> is also, I mean, I'm a biologist, so I was thinking that it's very easy to disturb in a very rapid way a system, no? and you take a lot of time to recover the system. But as a human beings that we thought, or we think that we you are more powerful, we should get the matter to, to use these tools in another direction when it's necessary. You know? but, and I, I um, well, the, the, we have two different situations right now. We have the situation in which social media, we, w people were able to use social media in a context where there was a unity already there, a unity in being um, disgruntled with the regime, with, with Mubarak's regime. So as I explained, that there were a series of events that happened over the past year or two before the revolution that caused a significant number of Egyptians to feel unified, regardless of the social media, against the regime. Social media then came into effect to use that and, and to push it forward a little bit further. Now we're in a completely different situation. There's absolutely no unity in Egypt. We're, it's very, very divided. Um, as I said, there's division within families. There's division among very close friends on what needs to be done and what's the right way to go with Egypt. Do we go with the democracy um, that has caused problem over this past uh, year or, or three? Or do we go with, and this is what a lot of people say, we need an iron fist, we need an iron hand to control the country because we're sick and tired of the stability, of the instability that we have in the country. We have division between the Egyptian people and so social media is not going to, it's, it is being used, but it's not going to be able to unite people together. People need to be united for social media to be able to push them that step further, like what happened with the 2011 revolution. But it's not, it's not social media that's going to unite people together. They have to be united to begin with. When I was saying instability, I was meaning with democracy. <laughs> Thanks. Well, uh, <coughs> do you think that uh, the, what has happened in Egypt has been understood abroad? Um, Especially in Western, uh, in the Western countries. Uh, we, well, from what I've read of Western media reports, I would say the Western media does understand 
or, or not all of them, of course, but many of the Western journalists were based in Cairo, who have been based there for a long time covering the situation. I think they report fairly on what the situation is. Um, that doesn't mean that the West follows events closely enough to understand what's happening within the country. Um, it's, I think, you know, just from my own experience, it's very difficult to follow the events in a country that's far away from where you are closely enough to know what's, because it's quite a complicated situation. I live, in, or I lived in, in, in Cairo, in Egypt, and I was part of the events, and I still find it very difficult to understand. Um, so I, I, I would not imagine that a, a general Western public would find it easy to comprehend what's happening on the ground in Egypt at this point. I do think, though, that there has been some fair um, and balanced reporting in Western media of what's happening or in some Western media. Thank you. On the other side. Hello. Uh, I'd like to make... <laughs> I'd like to make you a question uh, focusing on condition as a journalist rather than as a woman. In her introduction, Mercé Piquera said that before watching the news, she was already aware of what was going on because she was following your tweets. Then you refer to the fact that uh, you, had to, you had to watch Al Jazeera to have both sides of, of, of the story, let's put it this way. And I'd like to ask you uh, whether, uh, do you think that journalists in general are losing control of the information because of the fact that uh, everybody can report. Uh, this could apply, uh, for instance, to the Tahira Square as people reporting it, or as a science journalist, anybody can open a blog and talk about whatever. We have increasingly people getting informed or pseudo informed, or they believe they are informed through uninformal ways. Yeah. What, what's your view on this? Um, I'm actually a supporter of what we call citizen journalism. Um, for about six months, I was involved in a project um, uh, organized by something called the International Center for Journalists um, to train Egyptians, Egyptian citizens, on how to report um, events, local events. And I think, I think it's very good that anybody can be on the ground in a certain event and report what they witness. I don't think that's where the problem is. I think the problem is in the minds of the people who receive the information. We have a problem um, uh, that it, we, we don't verify, as, just as, as the general public, we don't verify the information that we receive. We are now bombarded with information from so many different sources, uh, from the media, from blogs, from Twitter, from Facebook. Um, we're bombarded with this information, and you need to be able to be aware that not every single thing that is said in any of these communication channels is necessarily fact. And so what we really need to work on is getting the general public aware <coughs> of how to verify information and how to look at more than one source and not to depend on one singular, singular source as a credible source of information. And even the media, is actually, especially the media in Egypt at this stage right now, is, can be considered a very incredible source of information. And people need to understand that because the media is being used as a propaganda machine within the country. And so it's not about the journalists losing control. It's, um, it's much more complex than that. And ha having people, uh, people having the ability to communicate information is a, is a good thing, in my opinion, no matter what channel they're doing it through. What we need to make sure happens is that the receiver on the other end learns how to verify what they receive. Hi, I think uh, you were in Barcelona three years ago. I don't know if you had uh, the opportunity to go to Plaza Catalunya, yes, our Revolution Square. Yeah. I did. And I would like to know, um, how does it make you feel that so many people in the Catalan Square and in other squares over the world 
are inspired by mm. your revolution and, and by your country because there are huge difference mm. between your country and ours. For example, we have the side our government, our politicians, you know? Um, I think, well, I'll tell you what I feel. Um, I feel a sense of brotherhood um, and a sense of pride. So the sense of pride being that we were able to do something in Egypt, even though it might not have been long lived. We'll never know if it's long lived until, it, you know, we have to wait for several years to see what, what actually pans out. Um, but even though it feels right now that the situation is grim, but it, it, we have great pride in seeing that we have been able to inspire others to follow in our footsteps, regardless of the different context that all these different countries are in. Um, at the same time, um, I always feel a sense of brotherhood. When, uh, like right now when I'm following the events in the Ukraine, um, I, f I always feel like I'm watching my brothers and sisters um, um, in the Ukraine and their struggle, and I f always see so many parallels between what they're going through, even though the context is very different still. But I always see the parallels more than I see the differences um, in what they're going through and what we went through and continue to go through. And so there's a sense of you know, brotherhood. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. Uh, do you think that uh, Egyptian and all Syrian, all the um, these kind of conflicts have been? I don't know. You know about Ukraine and how the media uh, thinks that some words are more important than others. For example, if you buy nowadays um, the news, the newspaper, you can see six pages of Ukraine and maybe half page of Syria or Venezuela. And how, I don't know, how the media and how the politics make this worse be forgotten and the others be important. I mean, every kind of war, I mean, in Africa and Syria, any kind is important. And why do they do this? What do you think? think or feel about this? Well, there are many different reasons why they do this. Mm -hmm. It can be where they have correspondence. They have correspondence in one country, or they have the money to send correspondence somewhere, and they don't have the money to spend, send correspondence elsewhere. Um, it could be that there's some sort of an agenda, uh, a political agenda, um, uh, or the media, the newspaper's agenda, or you know, the media organization's agenda, and which issues are more important to them. There are so many different reasons why certain issues get covered more than other issues. Um, as a reader, um, again, and this goes back to this other question, it's my, I think, it's, I, the media, I can't, I can't hold the media accountable for everything. I need, to be, I need to hold myself accountable to find the information myself. I can't just depend on The Guardian or on you know, whatever newspaper to be my source of information, and that's where I know what's happening about the world. I need to be able to pursue information, to pursue knowledge, and to find things out myself. I can't just continuously blame the media for not get, getting the message out, because that, that's just too easy as an individual to do. You have to put some of the accountability and some, some of the responsibility on your own shoulders, and you have to find out yourself what's happening. And even though some media are covering certain issues extensively and not focusing on others. If you look around, you'll find other media who are focusing on these other issues quite well. And so it's your responsibility, probably more so than it is the media's responsibility. Thank you. Bueno, si, si no hi ha cap més pregunta, ja acomiadarem la... Hi ha algun, algun, algun més, no? Bé, el, then we thank you very much for having uh, given your uh, your how much your testimony uh, your win you were the uh, witness testimony yes yes we don't say uh, thank you very much and uh, suppose al president vice president deixa que acabi o vols vols venir and in nom del president de l'institut que s'excusa per no venir en nom del vice president i en nom de la